Um, before we start, I'd just like everyone to give a big round of applause to the World Transform volunteers who made this happen. <laughs> And God knows that they've done a better job than the referendum vote for the UK to leave the EU. Um, and we saw Jeremy Corbyn sweep up 40% of the vote during the general election. And the pundits failed to get any of those right. So why is this? Is it because politics is becoming increasingly unpredictable because we have new unknown externalities like social media? Or is it simply because they brought their own biases to the table and they didn't want to see the facts for what they were? I'm getting a sense from what you're feeling. <laughs> um, so to help us answer this question, I have Ash Sarkar from Navarra Media. Hey. <laughs> I have... Matt's our cousin, former Corbyn spokesperson. Woo! I have Stephen Bush, special correspondent for the New Statesman. And Rachel Shabby, author and journalist. So how we're going to run the session will be... We'll have a little opener from each of the panellists, then we'll have a bit of a chat between So think of some questions as we go. Um, so Ash, I'd like to start with you. Because one thing that I find really interesting about this conversation is we've increasingly started to blame centrist, forget it wrong, like centrist commentators or right-wing commentators. They just don't understand. But a lot on the left didn't understand, and not many of us predicted it. So we are just as to blame. How do you feel about that? Oh my god, I feel like you've just, like, slew me. I mean, I, I had something to talk about and I thought I'd take this opportunity in front of 200 people to do it. <laughs> so, um, I got it wrong. I thought that uh, Labour would be annihilated. I went out, I campaigned for Corbyn, but I did it with this millstone around my heart. I thought that the country was, you know, kind of irrevocably right-wing, xenophobic, nasty, badly dressed, and that those things could only <laughs> stay that way. And the reason I thought this way is that, one, I'm an anarchist, so we haven't gotten anything right since, like, 1890. And two, my political awakening was 2003. Like, I'm sure um, it's, it's the case for many of you as well, right? The Iraq War. And so for every political movement that I've been a part of since then, whether it was protests at Operation Cast Lead, whether it was part of the anti-war movement, whether it was nuclear disarmament, whether it was uh, campaigns against fees and cuts or police violence, it was defeat after defeat after defeat. And so I'd kind of forgotten, one, what hope felt like. I was just like, oh, God, there's this kind of stirring, like somewhere near my diaphragm. It's unsettling, and I feel a bit nauseous. <laughs> and I thought that the lesson to be learned from all those things is that statist projects, right, ones with national ambitions, were to be eschewed. I thought that any movement that had scale at the forefront of its mind would have to make these completely unconscionable compromises. And I think we found that this is no longer the case. I forgot that it was possible to change people's minds, and that you can do that without appealing to disposition or kind of lofty morality, but by appealing to their material conditions. I forgot, in short, that change was possible. So that's why I got it wrong. What about you? <laughs> this isn't about me. This is about Matt's old cousin. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. Uh, I, I obviously, I worked for Jeremy Corbyn. I was a spokesperson for a year. Um, and I think that, in that, obviously, in that time, I got to know him, got to know who he was, and what a uh, competent and capable politician he is. And also what a great campaigner he is. I think the, the first leadership contest and, and the second certainly proved that to everyone. Um, so I knew that once we got into the short campaign, that it, it would switch from the day-to-day -day grind of being leader of the opposition and into sort of the campaigner that he's always been. And he's a, a very, very good campaigner. Um, I thought the, the leak of the manifesto 
uh, got everyone's in, got everyone interested in policy, turned the debate away from Brexit, the framing that the Tories uh, wanted the election to be fought around. And then we started to talk about domestic policy. And the reason we started to talk about domestic policy is because the status quo is not working for a lot of people. And the assumptions of the commentators were predicated on the idea that the status quo is working for a lot of people, we'll ameliorate it. If you don't do that, if you don't just stand on a platform that wants to ameliorate the status quo, if you want to try and transform it, then you're going to lose. Um, and a lot of the commentators grew up in this tradition, this political tr tradition, uh, from 97 onwards. Um, I won't name names, but it's pretty much broadly 90% of the commentary. Um, so, uh, St Stephen, not, not including Stephen, I think. Uh, uh, or Rachel. Um, so I think that what we've seen then is, uh, I think you can broadly conceptualise the commentators into two distinct camps. You've got the people that wanted it to work and didn't think it could, sort of the leftist platform that Corbyn put forward. And uh, you know, the, I'd say it was, they're, they're sort of the Polly Toynbee people. And then, and then I'd say that there were the people that didn't want it to work, but also uh, didn't think it could. And they were the sort of Jonathan Friedland people. Um, <laughs> And, and uh, irrespective of that, what they were basing their assumptions on obviously outdated. And you know, the, 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 the context has changed and therefore I think politics has to change. Political parties have to respond to that. And the Tories were, in, the, in this election, they were fortunate in a sense that Brexit was happening because they were implementing something that would transform the country. But next time around, after Brexit, you know, sort of we've gone through the, uh, the negotiations and there was some kind of solution to settlement from that. They're not going to have, uh, they're going to have to put forward something transformative because the country is still going to go down the direct, in the direction it's been going in. So I think uh, the, the transformative program obviously broke with a lot of um, uh, orthodoxies. People didn't, think it could, people didn't think it could work. I think obviously Jeremy Corbyn proved him wrong. Um, but I think that also they, they didn't even give Jeremy Corbyn a chance to, they didn't even try and find out why people liked him or why, why the Labour selectorate liked him. They just wrote them off as trots and they didn't take them seriously and they didn't realise that it was actually ordinary people joining the Labour Party to, to support Jeremy Corbyn because he was authentic and he had integrity. So I think there was a, multiple factors, but that, that's just a few. <laughs> You've definitely been keeping a, a good list and a bad list for this Christmas then. Yeah. <laughs> Stephen. Well, I think in terms of the, you know, didn't the left get it wrong as well, I think there's, there's wrong and wrong, isn't there? So there's kind of going, yeah, so uh, during the election I made a documentary and, and Matt very kindly uh, decided to be, to be in it. And one before we were recording, I was like, oh, yeah, I think it's, it's going quite well. And I was like, yeah, I think he is surging. I was like, but I think it's only inside big cities. I, I don't think it's going to go well outside of them, right? Which obviously turned out not to be true. There were some people who thought it was going really well and Labour was going to surge all the way into office. That turned out not to be true. There were some people who thought Labour was surging and they correctly got it that there was going to be a hung parliament. And I think those three things are all kind of fine because you're drawing a conclusion about reality. There were a lot of people who were still on the 7th of June going, no, he's not surging. Campaign, his campaign's really bad. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been a terrible campaign. And that... And it's kind of, you know, in, in, yeah, when you're doing like a maths GCSE, you get two points for showing you're working, right? And only, <laughs> and only, and only one point for, for the conclusion, right? And there's, and there, but there's, there's a reason for that, right? You know, like, to take, say, Dan Hodges, right? He correctly predicted, he correctly predicted the 2015 election because he was said UKIP would collapse, right? So he got the election correct, but UKIP didn't collapse. That is not why David Cameron won the 2015 election. He, he was completely wrong. And because he, his working was bad, that is why he's got every other political event since wrong. And I think, <laughs> and I think the reason uh, why you have kind of people who, who've shown their working and people who don't is, um, is basically the, the problem with political journalism, particularly in, in the United Kingdom where everything is so centralised around London, is their safety in numbers. I strongly all urge you, if you haven't, to read the very good interview Matt did with, with Jacobin, in which he talks about his experiences of coming in as, as Corbyn's uh, press guy, and I think turning a lot of people around in the lobby around on, on Corbyn. 
Um, but the thing is, is then it's the only place where your boss goes, so what's going to happen? And then the person sitting next to you, their boss phones and goes, what's going to happen? And actually, the sensible thing to do is to go like, so what is going to happen? Because if we're both wrong, right? And that's the thing about, like, when people say, like, oh, the pundits got it wrong, well, there's safety in numbers, isn't there? And, um, and even more so when you have a pundit class which is overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly male, overwhelmingly uh, from to, I mean, actually depressingly from one university, like, a, a, actually, it's e the, the establishment is even more uh, kind of concentrated than, than it looks. And I think that's the main reason why people got it wrong, was groupthink and kind of safety in numbers. Rachel? Yeah, um, so, yeah, I would add to that. I agree with everything that, that has come before, but I think, as well, um, political journalism in the UK, and especially lobby journalism, um, it's just really, really cynical. I mean, people are just really, like, there's so much miserableism in that sort of section of journalism. And to be fair, if my sphere of journalism was, you know, covering domestic UK politics and hanging around Westminster and British MPs, I would probably have all my faith in humanity sucked out of me <laughs> as well. So, you know, you can see where it comes from. But I think that just means that um, that kind of journalism fails to understand hope. And uh, if um, politics that people have got wrong over the past few years has been about anything, from Brexit to Trump, it's been about hope. Um, and so when it came to Corbyn, um, this kind of undertow of just oh, it will never happen, and everything's gloomy, and people are awful, right? Um, it meant that everything was seen through that frame. So these huge rallies during the election campaign didn't mean anything because, you know, they were just a bunch of Corbyn crazy nutters that weren't representative of society at large. Um, the fact that the manifesto was so popular and those policies really resonated with the public didn't mean anything because nobody votes on the basis of politics. Um, the fact that Momentum did this incredible job of um, canvassing and getting people out to campaign, uh, using, galvanizing the kind of the numbers and the interest and the enthusiasm for Corbyn and using it uh, to have political conversations. Um, that didn't mean anything because all Labour was doing was piling up votes in areas where they didn't count, right? So none of it mattered. And I think, you know, if you're predisposed to being cynical, then that's going to be your frame of reference. Um, I think uh, one of the other things that went on is that uh, generationally, the, a lot of the um, political commentators who have prominence and influence are, are of an age where they've quite clearly internalized uh, the prevailing politics of the last three decades. So that whole kind of centrism, you know, unfettered free market, um, you know, those very narrow parameters of where politics takes place um, is, very, is very much internalized by, by comment commentators. Um, and you could see that during the campaign because people... Um, would take issue with things like, you know, free hospital parking and free school meals for kids, right? With their hand on heart, say that they were taking issue with these things for progressive reasons. And you're like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, do we have to have this conversation about how universalism isn't anti-progressive? Um, so I think that clearly was, was a factor, the frame of reference. Um, and the other thing that Stephen mentioned, uh, which I'm going to mention as well, because I always do when we have conversations about media, that the lack of diversity um, is, is, is a massive problem. It's not, you know, this idea that, you, you know, diversity is some kind of, you know, doing people a favour <laughs> by being inclusive. It's really not about that. It's about bringing in different people from different classes and different ethnic backgrounds so that the thinking can become more diverse. And I think what, one of the things that's happened in um, British political journalism in the last few decades is that it's become really, it's like an inbred village. I mean, it's really <laughs> super, just super narrow. And one of the things that was, um, I think, a really big problem with that is that after the election, uh, you saw a lot of younger journalists say they got it wrong, but actually they really wanted to uh, support Corbyn publicly, but 
um, there were laughter, or they felt like it would be a really stupid thing to do. So, like, to me, if, like, one of your jobs, if, you, if you're a senior journalist, is to create an intellectual, an intellectually open culture. You want to open the conversation. You want to broaden the, the parameters. And if people who are younger than you don't feel intellectually confident, um, then you've got a really big problem. Um, although fortunately, <laughs> since uh, uh, quite clearly, you know, all those senior political journalists did get it wrong and, you know, elders didn't know better, uh, it's something we don't really need to worry about anymore, hopefully. <laughs> So leading on from your point about more senior um, journalists, I'd like to maybe start off the discussion by talking about what, what is the role of a pundit? What is the role of a commentator? Because perhaps we saw during the election that it was a vanity project. It was a space where you projected your own biases and your own view of the world. Is that what journalism is, or should we be assessing facts? Do we have a, like, a moral obligation to readers? to be giving them a little bit more than just our, impressing our friends on Twitter? Um, Ash, we'll start with you. I mean, I think the answer to that is obviously journalists have a responsibility to dig deeper, to frame things in edifying context and you know, actually be able to get out there and do some good work. I think that often that doesn't happen, not simply because journalists are lazy or incompetent or stupid or male malevolent, it's because if you're on a precarious contract or you're not on a contract at all, right, you're a freelancer, right, your bottom line is chat shit, get paid. <laughs> because if you develop a reputation for someone who's, you know, um, going to run stories which your, you know, editors or people who are commissioning you don't think are going to fly, you're just, you know, how are you going to pay your rent tomorrow? So one of the problems that we have here is a structural problem in journalism and not just a cultural one. In terms of what do I think journalists should be doing, I think that there's a tendency now amongst the kind of, you know, slightly more senior editors and um, commissioning editors is to say, well, look, what we've learned in the last two years is that, you know, expertise is now fraff, right? Pundits don't know what they're on about, they miss the point, and the electorate is too volatile. We throw out all the old orthodoxies out the window. And I think that that is equally um, a bad journalistic practice. Um, practice. I think what we should be looking at is like, hang on, what are the salient historical, economic and social shifts that we can contextualise these um, events in? Because actually Corbyn didn't come out of nowhere. Trump didn't come out of nowhere. Brexit didn't come out of nowhere. They were produced by concrete material forces. And what we need to do is think about the kinds of structures that allow journalists <coughs> to get into that. Because as it stands, what we have is a huge freelance pool, right, of disempowered, um, often young and often female um, workers in journalism who are unable to locate the pulse of politics outside the corridors of power because their seniors simply don't allow it. Huh? Um, people often talk about the, the blurred line between news and comment and how that's, you know, but I think there's actually a bigger problem in... Uh, political commentary, and that is the blurred line between political analysis and outriding. And I have never been made any secret of the fact that I'm a Jeremy Corbyn supporter. I'm uh, an outrider for him. Uh, if you've ever watched Arsenal fan TV, <laughs> I'm the equivalent of, uh, of that for politics. I'm not making any sort of secret of that. <laughs> so, so is Danny Finkelstein who is a Tory peer, right? He, you know, he's a co Times columnist, but he's a Tory peer. You know, he is a Tory supporting outrider, effectively. Or he's, a, you know, he's a legislator. So I think you know, Stephen, I'd say, is a political analyst. He takes an objective view. He speaks to everyone. He, spoke, speaks to, you know, he was one of the few people who actually made an effort to, you know, when he's writing, trying to find out what's happening, rather than got some you know, shit on Jeremy or whatever. Uh, he's actually trying to find out from me what's actually happening, you know, and, um, and I think that's probably the main issue. I think it, the, the role of, the, the, there is a space for analysis and there is a space for outriding and I think we have to make that distinction and make that clear to the reader. I mean, I, th I think you're right. I think, you know, like, 
I'm a commission editor on the opinion desk at The Independent, so it was my job essentially to be involved in this process. And we do have pieces of analysis, and then we will commission someone like Matt um, when we won a, like a, a, a pro-Corbyn line. Um, and actually what was really interesting about the election was um, we can look at our traffic in real time, um, and all of the pieces, the opinion pieces that we were putting out, which were pro-Corbyn, Matt's, Rachel's, um, they just went viral. The traffic on them was incredible. And it was at that point when I was like, oh, he might, he might something's happening. Um, so the, the, the pieces are there, but I think mm. it's about being clearer to your audience. Is that by being clearer in bylines at the end of pieces? Like, do, is there, do we need more transparency? Yeah, I, th I, think, I think so. Um, but I think that there is a lack of... Um, so... There should be, I think, objective political analysis. That's what's missing right now. Uh, it's not that there are... I mean, there, there is a, a paucity of left commentators as well, and particularly at The Guardian, which is most disappointing. Um, but I think that there is a lack of objective political analysis, and I think that, that, those, that those that portray themselves as objective political analysts are uh, of a time or a politics that is pretty much outdated. And, you know, you, there are certain commentators... You, who are sort of from this tradition, the centrist tradition that Rachel was talking about, they have benefited very well from the status quo, from what I would call kind of Blairism, neoliberalism, and they can't understand why everyone else doesn't really like what they like or isn't doing as well as they're doing. And they can't really see the world through anyone else's eyes. So I think that they're exactly right. Diversity is really important. It needs to be a lot more, more younger people in there as well. Um, I think that would make a huge difference. How do you feel the situation is at the New Statesman when you write? Um, so, I, so I write the politics column, uh, which is kind of this weekly thing. So it's a bit like um, uh, when you're... So I spend this continual state either in, either unhappy because I haven't written it yet or unhappy because it wasn't very good. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I see the function of, of that page, basically kind of the sort of old golden idea I have in my mind is, you know, whether if, if it's about the Tories or so, you know, the Tories think that they lost because of X. As a result, they're doing Y. Will Y be effective, yes or no? Um, I, I'm, I'm very pleased that you think I did take the time to talk to all of you, So uh, because I, I did, did definitely try. I think, um, and I think it's important to have both that kind of, look, here's what these people want to do, here's why they think it's going to work, that kind of analysing someone on their own terms. I don't think it is actually necessarily something which uh, is about Bylines. I think the trouble is, is then it's it's very easy not to be honest with yourself about what it is you're you're um, trying to do. And I think also the other problem is the longer the longer it is that you do something, um, the more the more of a pain it is to go. Oh God, am I really going to have to spend another Monday calling people to ask them questions which they might actually find quite boring to be asked? Uh, I mean, so yeah. So when the exit poll flashed up, I had kind of my immediate. Uh, the reaction was was laugh, laughing with joy. And then my second reaction weirdly was, oh, thank God, I'm not going to have to get to know another set of people around the Labour leader. <laughs> yeah, just like, yeah, like... Yeah, yeah like... And, and I think part of the, the problem that has gone wrong with a lot of uh, political commentary, right, is there were a bunch of people who, when Jeremy was elected, went, oh, for fuck's sake, yeah, I've put all of this time and effort pretending I found Yvette Cooper's campaign interesting, right? <laughs> um... I mean, seriously, if, if you've ever tried to find a news line from an Yvette Cooper speech, uh, when, when we all had to interview, the, interview all of the candidates, there was this, like, palpable silence of just, like, who wants to interview Yvette Cooper? <laughs> and, um, and then eventually, basically, I was just like, well, um, you know, Helen, you're funny. <clears throat> Maybe you can get her uh, to do something interesting. I, she, she couldn't. It turned out that it's just impossible. Um, but if you've, if you've put a great deal of time and effort into that, right, there were a lot of people who their, their basic bet was, oh, well, the Labour Party's having a bit of a midlife crisis and then Jeremy will go away and I will just put a lot of work into, uh, into these people. And I think it is partly about an attitudinal change. Like, there are just a lot of people, and I think this is where the safety in numbers and the kind of di lack of diversity, who don't seem to do things I would regard as core competences of of your of, of, of our jobs. Um, you know, 
you, you can see it now with like this huge cottage industry of people who are going like, oh well. I mean, obviously their campaign was terrible, uh, but they are. Oh, you know, the, their campaign was terrible. Labour's campaign was great. Um, no one. There will never be as big a gap between the two. Therefore, the next election will be normal. Um, and it's because that is like the way to have an easy life, basically. Um, so I think it is partly that people in our industry do have to kind of work a bit harder. What What are those key competencies for the commentary app? I, I think yeah, you, you sort of have to. Yeah, you know, kind of, where, you know, whatever the sort of issue you're writing about, it's like, well, yeah, I mean, so, yeah, actually, in terms of what I'm writing, probably going to write this week, which is that the Conservative Party is not, is not taking uh, Jeremy Corbyn seriously uh, yet. They have this weird thing where they go, like, I'm really worried he might win. You're like, OK, so what's your plan to deal with this? And like, well, we're going to attack him on Uber. We think that's going to move a lot of votes. You're like, really, do you? Um, and so I, I think, you know, to write that well, you kind of have to go like, well, you have to talk to someone in the leader's office to find out how they think the Tories are doing uh, attacking them. You have to talk to someone who works around Theresa May to find out how they think it's going, someone in the Tory party who hates Theresa May, and then, like, which is quite easy, to be frank. Um, <laughs> that's actually the easiest part of my job now. Um, <laughs> And then you have to kind of find someone in the Conservative Party who is worried about Jeremy Corbyn winning and thinks that, you know, and what they think they need to do to see. And that way you know that you have got all of the opinion, you know, all of the opinions that, and then you kind of go like, well, here's what people have told me, what do I do? But it is very easy, uh, depressingly, to just phone someone they're like, okay, mate, how are you feeling? How are the kids? Brilliant. Right, excellent. I'm going to file now. And I think that has been the problem with a lot of commentary is that latter approach. It's putting the journalism back in comment journalism rather than it being just sort of like an expression of your feelings on a given Yeah, I think um, a lot topic. of people do tend to treat comment as kind of like retirement almost. It's just like, you know, like, you know, I've done 20 years of reporting, but now I have a column. Um, and I think actually that you do have to put the same, yeah, so you have to have the journalism in there as well as the comment. Yeah. Rachel, you've written comment pieces for, for us at The Independent. Do you, when you write them, are you out there speaking to people? Or is it something that just comes from, comes from you? Yeah, I don't really like those hot takes where you don't get to talk to anybody. Because, you know, when people say, can you file a piece on this in two hours? And you're like, really? Don't you want me to think about it a little bit? Or <laughs> maybe make a few calls? I don't know. Wouldn't that be helpful? So I'm not... Imagine. <laughs> Imagine, yeah. But I think, um, you know, it has become, you know, the whole industry has become very much about hot <coughs> takes and there's not a lot of um, time or resources um, to, do the, to do the right thing, which is <laughs> go and talk to everybody and come back when you know what's going on, right? Um, that doesn't really happen so much. Um, but I think with the pundits that we've got now, I mean, for me it was really interesting to see how quickly it went from, so after the sort of... The, the, the unexpected labour surge, how quickly people went from, yeah, we got it wrong, to, well, could you really have got it right? I mean, who would have got it right in these circumstances? And then to, well, we didn't get it wrong at all. He did. <laughs> He's still rubbish, and everything we thought previously was right. Because I think, you know, there is a very sort of self-confirming culture amongst um, uh, commentators, and it is that lack of diversity. It is a bunch of people who do feel entitled to tell us what leadership is, what electability looks like, and what it doesn't look like. Um, I don't know if you guys remember, these were the people who were enthusing when Corbyn was just elected, and they were despairing about how he was, what was it? Incompetent, not a leader. What was the other thing? Unelectable. How, how could we forget that one? Unelectable. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, if you... What was that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But those are like second, second degree complaints. <laughs> um, yeah, so a few months after that, Hillary Benn stood up and, talk, and it was a Syria debate and, and, and they, were, they were all gushing about what a leader he was and how statesmanlike <laughs> and amazing it was. But he basically just went, you know, war is bad. <laughs> death is awful. It's like, yeah, mate. <laughs> 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 it really is. Um, and, and that was it. It was like um, people who have uh, affinities or um, affi affinities with that kind of person. So 
leadership means coming from a particular frame, coming from a particular class, looking and acting in a certain way. And, and I do think that the job of, of some of the commentary, they won't, they, whether they admit to it or not, is to police for us the parameters of what, what is acceptable in politics and what isn't. Um, so, you know, we could do with smashing that open a bit. <laughs> So I feel like when we're having this discussion, we keep sort of floating back to this, like, almost like media ogre we've created in our head, where it's an evil centrist dad, one of Matt's favourites. Uh, you know, but we, we're all left-wing commentators, or, um, at least I am. Um, <laughs> and we, we also can fall foul of bias, and I think if we want to create a sustainable project, I think we need to look at these critiques and apply them to ourselves, as well as other commentators. And there is definitely a vein on the left where you can say, oh, you know, I really like the manifesto, I didn't like this one thing, and then everyone on Twitter's like, how dare you? <laughs> um, and do we, do we start to create the same conditions that have trapped centrists and right-wing pundits? I mean, I think absolutely. And there's a word that we kind of keep skirting around, and that word is ideology, right? The media is not just, you know, holding a mirror up to society, and neither is it simply this, you know, fourth estate, you know, checking the excesses of power. It has, as you said, a coercive function, a policing function, and one of the things that it does is kind of impose limits on that which is possible. And when it comes to thinking about how we create alternative media projects, whether it's something like Navarra Media, go to support Navarra Media. <laughs> I also hear there's some really great merch outside, Ash. I mean, seriously, we've got some very sexy merch outside. Like, cuffing season is around the corner, so cop it. Um, or something like Jacobin, which is kind of offering these, you know... Um, wonderful deep dive socioeconomic analyses or it's something like the canary which is supposed to be like a lot more consumable like a lot more shareable we're trying to achieve something and in a way we're trying to co-opt some of those coercive or indeed sometimes emotionally manipulative um tools for ourselves and the reason why i'm framing it in this way it sounds malevolent or it sounds a bit kind of dodgy but the fact is is that i'm not in i'm not in this game to you know accurately reflect reality i don't really care for reality what i care about is transformation what i care about is change but couldn't you say that that's exactly what some centrists would say they'd say i think the corbyn project is destructive for the uk and i'm not interested in talking about facts i'm interested in pushing this agenda which will save the uk from the red terror absolutely <laughs> absolutely which is why which is why I, I acknowledge that fundamentally this is a question of ideology and it's a question of power who's got it who doesn't and how do we get it and so that i'm not saying that you sink to the most depraved depths that are available and you start doing all these personal smears because also one of the things is that you know you didn't create these tools and at some point they will turn back on you and you've got to think about what you can you know use not simply in good conscience but to build this better world that you know we're actually striving towards and I think in the back of your mind you have to realize that media is the how but the horizon is something else Right? The horizon is not simply a more diverse world, but a more you know, equal world, a more equitable world, where people feel more empowered to speak up. I think that that's where simply mimicking the tools of the right or the centre won't work for us. And I think being able to distinguish, and I think that's what centrists tend to be quite bad at, is distinguishing between the horizon and the how. Right? Their horizon is, I think, as you said, the status quo. Their how is to just kind of bleat on at you about how everything is fine. Right? Like, right now, no pun, the momentum is with us because we've got some vision. And I think the most important thing is not to lose that vision and not to become complacent. I think that one of the most dangerous things is, like, a little taste of success because you think that the rest is simply inevitable. It's not. I think what the last two years have shown us is that the rug can be pulled out from you um, at any moment if you forget about grassroots movement building. And I think media can play a really wonderful, powerful part in that. I think if you're a commentator and you thought the amelioration of the status quo was uh, kind of what was the most electable, you'd be forgiven for thinking that before 2008. But then the 2008 financial crisis happened, the whole 
what the whole system was built on came crashing down. Um, and obviously, we're, we're still paying for that crisis now, uh, nine years later, and we've had cuts to public spending. We've had, you know, every, the, the average person has got poorer. And you can't then turn up, rock up with a kind of, um, we're just going to change it a little bit. I mean, you could, if, if the financial crisis never happened, that might have worked. I mean, I'm, 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 I come from the view of, like, I think that Jeremy Corbyn was necessary for the Labour Party to rejuvenate from a Labour Party perspective. If the Labour Party was going to win, it needed to move to the left. It needed to elect someone who had integrity. It needed to depart from the past, from Blair, from Brown, from what was a kind of neoliberal agenda. Um, as it happens, the manifesto we put forward was radical in the sense that we've shifted so far from where we were in 2007, 2008, before the financial crisis. But it doesn't, it, it's to achieve non-radical ends, really. Um, we just sort of want everyone to not be, you know, going to food banks and, you know, have I mean, enough teachers at school. on now, Matt. That's a bit... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but, but it's, it's right, in terms no, of no. to answer your question about whether I applied the critiques to myself, yes, I would have done. If, if, if Jeremy Corbyn hadn't done as well as he did in the election, I would have gone, thanks very much. This is obviously not for me. I don't know what I'm talking about. See you later. Because I obviously did. I, I wouldn't have known what I was talking about. And I said that all along. I said, if I'm wrong, you'll never hear from me again. Politics is clearly not my forte. <laughs> <laughs> but as it happens, I'm still here. <laughs> But, but so are the other commentators who got it wrong. <laughs> but if they're centrists and they're pushing a centrist agenda, then that's fine. Be honest about it. But don't pretend that you're an expert. <laughs> you're not. <laughs> Demonstrably. Anyway. <laughs> um, Stephen, do you think that there's an element of groupthink in the left? Well, everyone, there is? everyone groupthink. I mean, we're, 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 we're tribal animals and, and, they, and, they're, and our brains are wired to reward us for... Um, for going, yes, I agree, and, and making sort of agreeable noises at each other. And that is the problem. That, but that is the problem that, mm, that all... Yes, that yes. all yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, and I can actually feel like a, a sort of... And, and that, that's always a problem. Um, but I think one, as, 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 as Matt says, right, there, there is a big difference between... Um, yeah, I think it seems like it was perfectly legitimate to look at Copeland... Oh, God, the other by-election. I've forgotten Stoke. where... It, Stoke. Stoke. And the local elections and go... This doesn't look like it. You know, that, there, there was a perfectly data-driven case to think that uh, the Labour Party had a lot to do going into the election. Uh, the point was there wasn't a data-driven case at the end to say that they hadn't done an awful lot, right? Um, I think, you know, you, you can sort of audit yourself. I do partly because it's like a good, fun bit of free content towards the end of the year, kind of go back <laughs> and go like, what things did I get horrifically wrong uh, this year? Uh, I briefly got really spooked in 2016 that Zach Goldsmith wouldn't be demonising Sadiq Khan if they didn't have a really good evidence that it worked. So I started being like, you know, maybe this is a very clever move. It was not a very clever move. Um, <laughs> but I think, like, yeah, we, everyone does do that. I think where I would sort of depart from Matt's analysis of, like, oh, if you'd got it wrong, you should have vanished from the scene, right? If you think about the, lots of the mistakes that were made in the leader's office before you arrived and the kind of, like, getting more streetwise... If, if, I think it is important to have a, a, a culture where you can go, so what did I get wrong? What yeah. am I going to do differently? The difficulty, is, as Rachel said, is a lot of people basically went from going like, what did I get wrong, to, well, no one could have got it right, to, yeah. did I really get it wrong at all? Exactly. Um, <laughs> and it's like, well, that's, 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 not, that's not sort of like... But I think everyone has got to be aware of the fact it's always really, really sort of nice to pretend that everything is great and you didn't make any mistakes. Yeah, I mean, the, the lack of introspection was quite something, wasn't it? But, uh, but I think, actually, in terms of groupthink on the left, I think that it's slightly different. I think the bar is much higher on the left um, because um, the bias on the right is invisible. It's neutral. It's value neutral, right? So if you are coming at politics from the left, then you're constantly aware that you're not in the invisible politics zone where, where everybody is just, you know, being objective and not at all political. And therefore, you have to constantly prove uh, the weight of your analysis. So you're, you're constantly thinking about your own confirmation bias. Am I falling into confirmation bias? OK, let me check this. What, what can I see out there that supports that or doesn't support that? And I think, for me, one of the 
disappointing things about um, being a commentator on the left in the last two years is how little space there was for us to develop those ideas and for us to try and break out of groupthink and for us to progress, intellectually progress, um, our ideas because, because nobody wanted to hear it. I mean, you'd, you'd pitch to editors um, and not only would they say no, but they'd tell you why you're wrong and you're like, no, just no, it's fine. No, no is the standard. We don't need to get into an argument, an ideological argument about my pitch. Like, just no, it's fine. Um, so it, it, was, it was actually quite extraordinary, the lack of opportunity uh, to go out and do the kind of reporting and the kind of analysis that we should have been doing. And I think, you know, Ash, Ash is right to talk about um, creating other ways of doing that because it, it does have to be done. We don't want to stay stuck you know, we want to keep developing our ideas, right? So that, that was one of the frustrations, I would say. One of many. <laughs> and one of the other things I, I want to talk about tonight was one of the excuses that pundits who got it wrong give, which is um, politics is increasingly unpredictable because social media, it's a, real, it's a real technique, isn't it, to blame tech when things go wrong? It's never, never your fault. Um, but is there something in that? Do you feel, since we've started using social media more, and indeed most newsrooms are heavily dependent upon Facebook for traffic? I mean, social is king now in newsrooms, um, if, if you're digital, and most, most newspapers at least have a digital arm. Um, do you feel like that's changed, the way you write now, compared to if you, write, if you wrote in the past for just print only? I mean, I think it has changed the possibilities, and it's changed... Um, the potential for introducing arguments, but I think what Ash was saying before about the structural imbalance really applies there because, yes, there is more space for digital and for the left in the space created by digital, and it does mean that you can write differently and it does mean that uh, you can attract um, audience in a different way, but, again, we're, we're still looking at structural imbalance where, you know, most of the people who are prominent and influential are, are also salaried, <laughs> and, uh, and the rest aren't. And that, and that obviously, that level of precariousness obviously creates limitations on the kind of conversation you can have, regardless of whether um, digital has enabled things or not. Not to name names, because apart from that, we're not in that game. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, do you feel like your relationship with editors when you're pitching comment pieces has changed since the election? Do you feel like they, they give you more space? They're like, oh, maybe Rachel was on to something. Like, how does that yeah. dynamic work for you? I mean, maybe the time span was kind of, you know, Stephen's kind of trajectory of sorry, not sorry, we've got nothing to be <laughs> sorry for. I think there was a small, there was a small moment. Um, but, uh, it, it, yeah, I don't think it lasted that long, really. Um. Well, your, your polytoimbies were like, oh, I got it wrong. Uh, and that's good. Uh, and I think those sort of commentators have come around a bit. Uh, the Jonathan Friedlands have gone, even if I was wrong, it would be a disaster. So they've kept hammering the kind of their worldview. And I have no objection to that on, uh, you know, in principle, but I think that they should be honest about it and say this, this is their worldview and... They're not analysing from a perspective of a Labour Party perspective, in a sense. They're analysing from a centrist perspective. And if you're going to have a centrist commentator on your books that represents roughly 5% of the electorate, then you should have, I don't know, 19 left commentators. <laughs> the volatility of the electorate I think is a really interesting thing to look at because I think if you perceive politics as just a series of set pieces and in the short term then yeah things look incredibly volatile and I think we, we feel things to be really volatile right like we kind of go from you know 2015 2016 to 2017 and we're just like what the fuck has just happened like you know you kind of feel like you've emerged from this like you know six hour club night like oh god like what's happened to me but the thing is is that history doesn't 
work in that short term, right? And so if you want to say, well, Brexit came out of nowhere, you have to deliberately ignore uh, the tide of rising xenophobia in this country, which was stoked by new labor, right? Immigration detention was a new labor project, something which was capitalized by David Cameron and something which the establishment thought it could maintain control of. Turns out it couldn't, right? The monster they were feeding was so much bigger than you know, the infrastructure that they'd created to contain it could ever hold on to. I think that the problem with, you know, this idea of like, well, better journalism would fix this is that, well, data and better interpretation of data is just one step. The second step is finding relevant historical, social and economic context. And I know that sounds really boring, right? I'm snoozing myself to death just saying it. But I'm in a really privileged position because the majority of my money does not come from journalism. Thank fuck for that, right? I've got one foot in the academy where there is space to talk about these things, to write about these things. The only thing is, is no one fucking reads it. And I think we need some of those values which are nurtured in political science departments, history departments, even literature, social anthropology, etc., etc. And we need to find room for that in newsrooms, because otherwise everything's going to look like a surprise. Everything's going to look like, what the fuck? I'm just like, read Fanon, it'll explain it, right? Like... <laughs> And this might be part of the, the problem. So in a newsroom, like, um, so like my commissioning cycle will be um, news event hits, commission comment piece off the back of it. And during the election, that will be polls. And obviously polls were inaccurate, apart from YouGov, which, <laughs> well done, YouGov. Um, but you, your job isn't to say, oh, commentator, can you please sort of just think about the last 50 years worth of like social dynamics in the UK. It's like talk about this stat because that is like what people... So like an, another element to think about as well as social is SEO, search, search engine optimization. Newsrooms commission around that because that's the words that people are typing into Google and they type that word in and then they click on your article. So during the election, they'll be like latest poll labor. And so you, you, you heavily get your person to write on that topic. So yeah, it, it might be that the news, the way the business dynamic of newsrooms is actually the antithesis of what we need, which is why the long term... Um, I mean, a really, like, I think, um, key example of where this goes wrong or a misreading of data because it's been abstracted from power is looking at the 2016 um, American election. People went, well, the U.S. is on course to be majority minority by, I think, 2043. Therefore, that's, you know, the Democrats are a shoo in from now on because people who aren't white tend to overwhelmingly vote Democrat. And you can only think that if you don't understand that America has got a white supremacist state apparatus at its disposal at, to, one, suppress uh, the minority vote, and two, to impoverish minorities so they don't want to vote and they don't feel that they're reflected in candidates. That's how you can say Trump came out of nowhere, is if you look at that data on its own and you don't contextualise it within a history of power. Well, I think the, I think you're, you're partly right about also the uh, economy of newsrooms, right? For, for us at the NS, there are two articles that, if all I cared about was traffic, I'd write every day. One was, Jeremy Corbyn will win the next election, which I think is actually true. One is, Brexit won't happen, which sadly I think is not true. Um, the, the trick is, is how do you find a way of, of balancing both? Because I think the interesting thing about both, um, about the Trump, which I did not think would happen, uh, Brexit, which I did, uh, and the 2017 election, uh, which I kind of had this weird middle, middle ground, so I was, no, I was wrong on that as well. I'm just... <laughs> um, is that if you ignored all of... In, in all three of those, if you ignored... Um, if you basically went, oh, well, forget who's leading these various campaigns, you're like, will um, a government that has been enacting X number of cuts and is a creditor in the EU lose a referendum on a European treaty? You'd have gone, yeah, of course. If um, in, 2012, in 2012, after Obama had won, you've gone, oh, the economy will be growing at X amount, um, and, uh, you know, and the Republicans will have won X number of states who will win, you go, oh, a Republican president will win, uh, but maybe Hillary Clinton's approval ratings, which, because at the time, remember, she was the most popular politician, maybe that will allow them to squeak in. If you went, oh, well, her approval ratings will have collapsed, you'd have gone, well, they're fucked then. But everyone basically went, oh, well, trends don't matter because of, of these, um, these kind of personalities. I think the social media stuff does make it a little bit harder, right? Because, um, because we're all in this wonderful feedback loop on Facebook of, of people telling us things that we want to hear. So I really didn't trust uh, the fact that everyone on my Facebook was very excited about 
Jeremy Corbyn because everyone on my Facebook had been excited about the alternative vote. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so that's the thing. It, it does make it harder because you are, you know, it, and the problem for us is it is our, in our interests economically as journalists to wide to you know to thicken the walls of people's comfort zones mm -hmm. um the the challenge for us is how do we find ways of uh of fulfilling that need in a way that is actually intelligent and useful obviously the advantage with uh, pressing the button mark jeremy corbyn will win the next election is there are really good structural reasons why that's probably the case uh, if anyone can think of any good structural reasons why brexit won't happen please please do tell me <laughs> rachel do you have any thoughts on well, the Brexit will happen. <laughs> <laughs> on um, the, we should keep doing clickbait. Yeah, and, and basically how we on how we commission versus longer term I know, the views of the situation. Yeah, um, I mean, again, I think it's it, it is very much the structural stuff we're we're talking about. Um, so it's it's about it's about um, giving people the sort of ideological space, but also the sort of um, practical. Uh, comfort and capacity um, to 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 generate that kind of content, and that and that is a really long-term, deep thing. That's not going to happen overnight. That's years of thinking about it and um, and uh, trying to put it into place. And I and I think you know, it's, to me, it's still it's still very revealing that you know we talk about diversity and we can say that um, you know in terms of just on the page, in terms of content. Um, then yes, maybe journalism has diversified, but but you know when you look at power, positions of power, people who are editors, mm -hmm. people who are prominent writers, people who are given a prominent space, that is still very very narrow, and that doesn't change organically, um, and I, I don't really think we're going to be able to address the issue of content unless we address the issue of structure. And I think you're right, like. For me, commissioning during the general election and Trump and Brexit, we gave a platform to such a diverse range of voices. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the best articles during the election was an independent voices one, which was saying, you know, young people come out and vote. You can really change this. Like mm -hmm. we we said it, 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 it did well. But I think you're right. It's about who gets the exposure. Like when we talk about the pundits, who are we talking about? And mostly, it's a a sort of ruling class of pundits who, you know, do the paper reviews every day, get the Vox Box on TV, um, and we need to break up that cartel. Like, we need, like, people like you guys, like, doing those slots instead of some other people. <laughs> just, on, just a quick one on the structural problems. I, I know this can sound a bit radical, but I think it would do the commentary out of favour if polls were just banned. Yes. Because... It just reinforces pre-existing narratives and people get so bogged down in it. Honestly, outside of an election campaign, has anyone ever got... For some of, like, has anyone ever been like, polled? I mean, do you know anyone who's been polled? I mean, if, someone, if a pollster <laughs> rings you up, who's in government, Tories, all right, yeah. You're not thinking about it if an election's not been called. In an election campaign, I can understand there's a reason for it. Obviously, France banned them in an election campaign because they dominate the narrative. The narrative should be about policies and what the government's doing, and we shouldn't get bogged down in the day-to-day sort of -day tittle-tattle of Westminster, and the whole, pol the whole polling thing, I think, feeds into that, plays far too big a role. But and the way they're so. modelled is entrenched in bias. Like, there was the whole thing of um, why most of the polls got it wrong last time was because they said people say they vote Labour, but they won't vote Labour, so they downplayed... <laughs> So when people were like, oh, Labour's doing really well, but they were like, no, oh, but that's the modelling. Um, yeah. <laughs> modelling, yeah, it's all about bias. Uh, yeah, I think, I think there's definitely a case. Actually, just out of interest, a show of hands, who has been polled ever? Oh, it's a good sample. Okay. So they didn't call any of you guys then, did they, during the general election? Uh, and before we move into the questions, does anybody have anything that they feel like hasn't been raised that they'd like to talk about, about why the pundits got it wrong? I mean, we could be here all night, let's be honest. There's a party afterwards, everyone, go, we'll talk about it there. I mean, I think, um, you know, uh, my favourite silver fox on the telly, Jon Snow, got it right when he was... <laughs> Are we right? Um, oh, all right. <laughs> I, like, got it right when he said that the cat 
catastrophe of Grenfell actually crystallised lots of problems in our media class. So it wasn't just a man-made crisis in terms of the managed decline of social housing, but uh, emblematic of media callousness before there is a, you know, uh, there are mass fatalities. The fact that you had tenants' associations coming together and saying there will be a fire which will cost like dozens and scores of lives, that should have been um, front page news. That should have been, you know, covering the pages of every local paper in that area. The fact is that local papers in that same way don't really exist anymore. And it's not just about diversifying our media classes, because for me, equality doesn't look like more brown faces in high places, but saying the same old crap. It looks like really changing the structure so we can talk to, dare I say it, normal people about the material conditions affecting their lives. So I think you're right. Like Refocusing the media's attention on policy, I think, is one ginormous step in the right direction. But also perceiving politics not as something that comes from the top down, whether it's from you know the Labour leadership or from Polly Toynbee, but something that we're living all the time, that we're immersed in all the time, and that should be reflected in the content that we're consuming. And that segues quite nicely <laughs> into our Q&A session, because if you've learned anything tonight, it's that the pundits don't know shit, and we should speak to people more. So, um, Just before we move into the questions, though, please make sure it's a question. Um, no statements. If you want to ask a question specifically to someone, do say. Um, so can we have some hands for questions, please? And do we have the mics? Yeah. Cool. Uh, so man in the blue shirt. Uh, and can I see any ladies' hands? Some uh, and a lady here. Uh, just want to say thank you very much to all four speakers. You made some excellent points, and it's been a very um, interesting discussion so far. I haven't really got questions. I've, it's more question, please, <laughs> please, please. Um, just put a question mark at the end. Intonate your voice at the Rising end. Well, <laughs> always works. Well, <clears throat> if, I, if I do have one question, it's Great. just to touch on what Stephen <laughs> mentioned earlier. Why? Why? Do most journalists in the mainstream come from one university? I mean, it, it, it does strike me as rather bizarre that we do only seem to recruit from one particular university, and I think we all know which university it is, so I'm not going to mention it. Um, but now I've asked a question, I do want to make one common. Um, <laughs> which is, Can we? Uh, which, okay, which okay. Is, you all know, right, then. Um, nothing epitomised for me, what was wrong with the way political journalism has been done in this country more than uh, two incidents when uh, Dawn Foster went on to Sky News and, you know, prophesied rightly that there was going to be a hung parliament and was laughed at by, by Kay Burley. And when she goes on to Navarro, which I generously donate to, um, <laughs> she's, treated with, she's treated with much greater respect and her views are, uh, are treated uh, um, as being uh, worth listening to. And this bizarre um, uh, hypothesis of Jonathan Frieden, since we're you know, um, all beating up on him tonight, um, he... Just me. <laughs> he he you know, came up during the election campaign with this idea that, with no evidence whatsoever to suggest otherwise, that Yvette Cooper would be doing much better than Jeremy Corbyn in, in the election. Uh, or was it Martin Kettle? I don't know. They're, they're indistinguishable. But... Um, it, the, the, the point is, um, this is the problem. There, there is this arrogance and smug, um, we know best uh, idea um, that's under, undergirding what mainstream journalism is. But I did have a question, so. No, thank uh, you. Sorry, <laughs> and then we'll, one more question, then we'll, we'll take it. Uh, sorry, again. Um, and also, I'm a journalist, so this is, feels a bit like uh, asking questions to fellow colleagues. Maybe you should you know, pass the microphone. But very quickly, something you didn't quite talk about is this question of tokenism within comment, right? Because it feels like every time that we on the broad left, and I'm pretty sure that every single person on this panel, when we're talking about even more insular issues, will have very different views on certain things. Um, we're only taken onto mainstream media more often than not as sort of like a token. So for instance, because I worked for the Morning Star for a few years, I was only taken to speak on I, um, 
Channel 4 News about Corbyn from that very specific point of view and on nothing else. And the same is said about, you know, ethnic background, you name it. How do we combat this take? And it goes back to what Rachel said about this sort of, you know, right-wing bias is the neutral. You know, it's invisible in that sense. How do we combat this? Um, by making it still appropriate to have a commentator about a certain issue because they're an expert on that without just us being always reverted to for whatever reason on our identity and as a token. Anyone like to start? Um, I mean, my uh, response to why do most journalists come from one university and why are most journalists in the mainstream media so arrogant but is my answer to both those things the same, class reproduction in it. Uh, that, that, that's pretty much it. On this thing about being a token, which I read less as one of um, political identity and more one for me that I experience in terms of race and gender, you're only a token if you stay manageable for them, right? So I, you know, get put on telly and I'm sure that there are people patting themselves on the back for making Sky just that bit browner, but I'm only a token if I'm playing by their rules. If I make an intervention and say, hang on, this framing is bollocks, or this question is unhelpful, if I refuse to be manageable for them, then I no longer am. I don't have control over what their intentions are. And if I said no to every platform because I thought I was a token on it, then I would probably be unemployed. It's not why are you brought there, it's what you do when you get there that I think is of relevance. Um, I, I don't know why uh, they're all from the same university. Um, uh, I would suggest that they review their recruitment policies and maybe... <laughs> because politics is not a management science, it's an art, and anyone can be good at politics, you know. People have a very unusual perception or conception of what a politician is. They seem to think they're electing a some kind of manage, manager or CEO of the country. It's just a person who makes choices, whether you want to cut corporation tax or fund the NHS. It's pretty sort of simple, like, what are your values? That's why you're elected. That's why it's an elected position. Anyway, um, uh, in terms of, like, the tokenism aspect, I think li linked, to, linked to that, and I think what you were saying earlier about the traffic on left commentators' pieces, there, there, there are 40% of the electorate voted for Jeremy Corbyn, and they're not getting the... Mm -hmm. I think you'll see a, a change and move, move m towards more left commentators through what is essentially market means. So they say, oh, blimey, the traffic on here is good. Better get some more of them in. So you won't even need media reform. Media reform will take place, I think, naturally. I think you will end up getting... That, that will have to happen. It'll be a sort of natural equilibrium that develops. Otherwise, they'll just go out of business. Yeah, um, yeah I think, though, the... The specific point I think you were sort of making is that there's kind of this problem that, as you say, like, there are actually probably quite a lot of different opinions uh, in terms of intra-left issues, but you get called on as the kind of pro-Corbyn uh, voice, right? I mean, or, or actually on any kind of pro-left issue. I mean, this row over Uber is a really good example, right? There's probably from, like, you know, like, Matt probably just thinks we should nationalise it. I, in my very boring, boring, soggy social democratic way, like, we just need to regulate it better and make them pay more tax, right? But we all think that what they're currently doing is not fair. But on a panel discussion about whether about Uber's uh, corporate behaviour, we would be represented by one of us, chosen at random against yeah. Yeah. a right-wing MP, a right-wing journalist, and a right-wing think tank, right? And, and, and that is... And... One of the one of the ways to yeah, if we want to, to drag discussion in this country to the left and not just sort of temporarily win elections occasionally, right? But actually, to we have to combat that. I have absolutely no idea how. Uh, so I've just done that really useful thing. Like, great point, great point. <laughs> uh, yeah, fuck if I know what the what the solution to it is. Um, but it, it is a huge problem on telly and radio. Uh, I I don't know if it's part. I think. One of the, you know, yeah, the, the, the thing with the, the only one university is the, the way to change it is to make it embarrassing for people, right? Um, yeah, we, we, this, we were talking about this the other day in the office, and, like, this weird thing, and it feels like you can either be diverse and from one university, or you can be not from one university and not be, di and not be diverse in any other way, right? But those are the only two routes. Into, and it's like, and actually, 
you know, that, that great Glowns and Gowns and Clowns account, right, yeah. did successfully embarrass his people, right? It, it points out, like, oh, wait a second, there's a massive problem in this room. And I think part of the way we fix the TV <coughs> discussion problem is just, like, it is ridiculous that I have to, like, go and defend the whole of the left <laughs> against, like, yeah, whereas, like, you know... But they don't see that yeah. it's, 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 yeah. it's the difference, the complexity, no. the multitude yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, firstly on embarrassing people, it's amazing how unembarrassable they are. <laughs> because... <laughs> oh, you all remember that thing where um, the Labour Party announced that it was going to tax, um, raise taxes for people earning more than 80k, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, mainstream media was consumed with well, that's not very much money, is it? <laughs> and everyone else in the country was like, that's a shed load of money. <laughs> I would kill to have a salary like that. What the hell are you talking about, right? And you would think that that would be embarrassing. You would think that that would cause a moment of self-reflection of, goodness, if we all think, if me and my journo mates think that isn't very much money, but everyone else thinks it is, I don't know, maybe we're just really... <laughs> you, I don't know. Anyway, it, it caused absolutely... It didn't even cause a ripple. Um, and things like that happen all the time. So I don't know what we need to do to shame them. Um, but on the panels thing, yeah, completely. Because what, what it's, set, it's set up to make you the freak view. You are the, the person with the freak point of view because, you know, there's a panel of four. You're the one on the left, um, usually also female um, and or a minority. And, you know, every, everyone else uh, is being reasonable. <laughs> And you're the one that's always being obje objectionable, actually, because you're always going counter to the mainstream. And it's really tedious to always be the one that's um, objecting, right? So it creates, it creates a dynamic where you're complaining and you're opposing, you're oppositional. Um, and I think for me, um, you know, I, I do media training now because I think, you know, more, more left voices, <laughs> let's, let's have more left and, and one of the things for me is that, you know, you, you have to just no normalise that. So you have to have the conversation that you want to have, right? Um, and um, speak not to the panel, but to the people who, the 40%, right? And once, once that's your audience, then it actually very much changes the kind of conversation you end up having once you um, are aware that that's who you're talking to rather than panellists who you're always going to be um, set up to oppose. So that's in no, that's just a drop in the ocean, though. Obviously, there's structural stuff going on there too. <laughs> Any more questions? So, uh, guy in the white check shirt with glasses, uh, and then can we get the lady here with the um, blue puffs? Hi, um, my question is, do you feel pundits feel held to account by a new uh, wealth of punditry that's available in social media? Like Matt, you've mentioned Arsenal Fan TV. Uh, <laughs> some of the insights that come from Arsenal Fan TV is phenomenal. It's better than professional footballers sometimes. <laughs> and, <laughs> but also, um, maybe on a more serious note, as you mentioned Grenfell, and during the Grenfell Tower, I watched BBC, but then suddenly on uh, social media, people were recording things on their phones, and I was able to uh, have so much more information that made me doubt a lot of the things that I was seeing by pundit. So how do you feel about social media as um, something holding you to account, or is it changing the way that punditry is occurring? Thank you. The lady here. I just wanted to ask about the BBC um, uh, specifically because I think there was some academic work that showed that the BBC was significantly more biased against Corbyn than Channel 4, for example. Um, and I kind of don't really understand why that's the case. And 
Uh, is it still the case and what could we do about it? Would like to start? Um, I'd like to maybe address the social media and uh, Grenfell question. In terms of does social media hold pundits to account better, I would say yes and no. Um, thing about Twitter is that there's always beef, right? Just always beef. <laughs> and it becomes really difficult to distinguish that, like antagonisms which are politically meaningful and that you should participate in and some petty bullshit that just keeps dragging on and on and on. And there's something about the form which I think um, obliterates distinctions as well as sharpening them. So I think in terms of using social media as a method of accountability, that becomes quite difficult because you know, all you have is a kind of quite nebulous form of social power. You don't necessarily have leverage, which is often that meaningful. So that's a really, like, shit answer. It's a bit like, yeah, no. Um, but I think the reality of it is yes or no. In terms of social media as a reporting resource, again, it's something which can be intensely valuable. And I think you're right to raise the example of Grenfell. The reason why social media was so far ahead of the establishment media on that night and also in the days following is because for lots of journalists, they had their first time going to not just that estate, but any estate, right? They don't know who lives there. They don't know what goes on there. They don't know what kinds of, you know, community resources were there and were lost. Whereas if you live in that neighborhood or your mates live in that neighborhood, you know, you know what you're looking for and you know what that content is going to mean to people when you share it. The flip side of that, is that when things go out and they've not been that rigorously checked, so that can be really quite dangerous, right? So I think that social media is a tool, and like any tool, it can be a weapon, right? That can often kind of rebound on yourself. So I think that one of the problems of social media is that it becomes abstracted from other discussions like ones of values, ideology, responsibility. Um, I know that this isn't necessarily that hard an answer, but what I'm saying is that it's got, you know, it's here, it's got great potential, um, we've got no choice but to engage with it, but I think we need to be really thoughtful about how and why and what are the limitations of it when it comes to forming social movements. Yeah, just um, obviously picking up on the kind of Arsenal fan TV uh, comparison, um, uh, Arsene Wenger conceptualises this by saying that when he first became a ma manager, that we lived in what, what he calls a vertical society where there were a few experts at the top and they were the opinion formers and then that filtered down to everyone else. And in order to get to that point where you were an expert, I mean, I think he's just talking about sports journalism to be fair, but you had to prove your credentials, you had to prove that you knew the game and you knew what you were talking about. And now he says we're in a f horizontal society and, and everyone's got an opinion and everyone's voicing their opinion on Twitter and obviously some people are more influential than others, and some people are given that influence or granted that influence for different reasons. Um, and I think that it's really important that as we've transitioned from what Arsene Wenger called a vertical society to a horizontal society, that those who are still here from that previous construct, from that structural uh, setup where it was, you know, experts at the top, and and now in, a, in a, a sort of structure where it's a, a vertical society and there's more kind of democracy in the media, that they are held to account. Because there are, there are better people out there. We know that now. We know that actually there are no such thing as experts in, in this stuff. There are people with opinions, and those opinions and views can go out of date. And actually, if people are getting it wrong time and time again, then make some room for someone else who won't get it wrong every week. So I think that that's, that's really important. I think that's, that's the thing. Like, I mean, with, even with Arsenal Fan TV, they could fall into the same trap, you know. <laughs> <laughs> They're getting the same people up every, all the time. You know, Ty, his time's running out. Like, <laughs> you can't keep saying Wenger in every week. <laughs> um, what was the other question? Um, BBC. BBC. Ah. Versus, like, Channel 4, say. I think it's... Um, yeah, it's interesting, actually. I think that the BBC suffers from the same problems that the commentariat suffers from, in that there are people that are at the BBC who are ideological and who have politics, and politics that tends to be of the centre, and they've grown up and they've progressed their careers through the Blair years, and all their contacts are in sort of people on the political centre. And actually, I'm of the view that if at the BBC, 
We know, I know we want them to be impartial, but it's very difficult for someone who has come through the, the Conservative uh, club at Oxford University, whose dad's a Tory MP, like some political correspondents are um, at the BBC, to be impartial? Why don't we just say, like, all right, you be the Tory person and you make Tory stuff and you be the Labour person, you make Labour stuff and stop trying to get these people, shoehorn these people who are clearly <laughs> biased into this non-biased position. So I think that all needs to rethink, to be honest. I don't think you'll ever get it completely unbiased. There'll always be people complaining about it. And some people say, oh, that's because they're doing their job right. But it's not, really. <laughs> um, with regard to the social media question, um, I think in terms of being just from like a commission perspective, like when I get in in the morning, I'm like, okay, what pieces, what comment pieces do I want to be out there in the world today? Um, we're accountable to social media insofar as it's a hungry beast that we feed. It's like, what do you want from us? We'll give it to you, share it, <laughs> give us traffic. Um, because that's, that's the economy of the newsroom now, right? Um, and that's really great when, like, during the general election, it's like, oh, like, people want pro-Corbyn stuff, so you start looking around for more pro-Corbyn voices, and that's really exciting, um, because, I, you know, I work for a broadly liberal paper, so that will, you know, that, that fits with us, and that's okay. But I think that's, like Ash said, that's a weapon that can turn on you. And so we have another tool called CrowdTangle. And CrowdTangle, you can see who are the most... Um, Social, who, who's doing best on social out of like the, the world's news outlets and like give or take Breitbart is number one or number two in the world and they're tiny like and I think that's because they, they understand that dynamic they understand that there's like an audience there who wants a certain version of the facts and they'll give it to them and they don't care about the fact, like they don't care about you know who they damage in doing that and there's a lot of you um UK outlets who do the same. I mean, print's had that problem for a long time, right? You make front pages that sell. Um, but I think it, because of social and because we have these tools to measure, measure social, we can do it in real time. And that's kind of terrifying because, yet yeah, right now, Corbyn is in favour, so we'll put more Corbyn pieces out. But what if all of a sudden it's someone different? Uh, that's the danger of it for me. Yeah, I think in terms of holding uh, individual people to account, I think the problem, exactly as Ash says with, with, with Twitter, is because it's, it, there's always a ruck on there, it, actually I think it has the reverse problem. People will kind of go and say, like, some crazy person has said, and then it's a completely reasonable complaint. But because, as well as this reasonable complaint, someone swore at them, they've been able to go, oh, well. Whereas, actually, I think, weirdly, the, the tool which, when I've got something wrong, has most made me likely to go, oh, I shouldn't have done that, is one, uh, Matt texting me. Uh, and saying you shouldn't have done that. But, um, but two, also actually email. Um, you know, readers emailing you because they have to take more time on it and also no one ever emails you abuse. Uh, so yeah, you're just like, do. oh. Yeah. Okay, well, they, but they email you kind of, it's crazy <laughs> abuse, right? Do you know what I mean? Like, if, if this makes any sense, the abuse, I, the, the email abuse I get is so different from the emailed criticism, whereas on Twitter, the kind of like, Dulux colours chart, chart from abuse to criticism is, is fungible and it's really tempting to focus on the bit in the middle. Um, on the BBC point, I think they have this massive problem that they do think that if both sides are angry with you, then you've got it about right. But on, say, climate change, right, if both sides are angry with you, you have not got it right. On whether or not austerity is the correct way to manage the economy, you haven't got it, got it right. I, I think... In, the, fundamentally, the, the, the big thing that, that, ha, that sort of the big organising principle in terms of changing the media asset is to argue against this idea that impartiality and balance are the same thing. Mm. A actually, they're they're not right. The, the 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 truth is not some weird cosmic point in between two opinions on any given issue. One of those opinions is false, and they can almost always be measured. Right, like. It's not like, you know, like you can have an impartial debate on whether or not, I don't know, spanking is, is, is fun, right? <laughs> you, you, can't, you can't have an impartial debate on whether or not climate change is happening, right? There are just, there are just facts. And I think, yeah, as Matt says, we just have got to unpick that as an idea because that, I think, is the big problem. Because uh, I was going to say whether it's okay to spank your kids, and I was like, but it's not. And so I just... <laughs> I was... I just was, I was locked in, so I We're just We're all to friends swirl. here, it's like. okay, say what you want to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something quite tame <laughs> in comparison, which may come as a relief, I don't know. But, um, yeah, I think the problem, it's not just the BBC, but I think the problem across the spectrum here is that... Um, 
the center is not where centrists think the center is. Uh, and that's, that's a really big problem if you're trying to be impartial or if you're trying to be balanced. Um, you know, 30 years of an economic policy that has caused pain, um, exacerbated by an economic crash that plunged even more people into pain, um, means that this, yeah, yeah, <laughs> thanks, yeah, there's another, another round of that. It just means that the center isn't where people think the center is in things, in economic terms, um, and that is why uh, uh, the, the Labour Party's manifesto um, was so popular on many things, because for some time uh, there has been popular support for things like renationalization of utilities and energy companies. There's been popular support for um, investment in infrastructure. There's been popular support for raising uh, levels of corporate tax and um, you know, uh, going after tax avoiders. Um, so, and support for the NHS, support for the welfare state, right? So all these things where, um, you know, uh, media thinks there is some kind of debate that is more to the right. It actually isn't. Like, they've, they've shifted the conversation to the right, but that's not where, where the population is on a lot of these issues. So I think that's how we've got this sort of mismatch in the kind of political coverage. And then one last round of questions. Um, so can we have, we haven't had any from the back, have we, so far? There's a gentleman here in a white T-shirt. And then are there any women on the back who'd like to ask a question? No, OK. And do you want to ask a uh, Yep, yep. And then this lady here at the front, please. Yeah, did you get your mic? The, this, this, this. Yeah, you, sir. Yes, you. Oh, the sa guy in the salmon <laughs> bait. I'm so sorry. <laughs> How rude of me. <laughs> I was having a real sort of sartorial existential crisis there for a second. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to ask, I mean, I feel like everything has to be framed through sort of light BDSM chat now to kind of continue with the theme. <laughs> Um, but I, I was actually going to go back to the, the sporting analogy because um, I thought it was really interesting when, when Matt mentioned the financial crisis uh, and I'm interested in the extent to which kind of lobby journalists and pundits, in your opinion, Steve, I mean everyone, but Stephen maybe is perhaps kind of closest to, to, to that tribe, uh, have acknowledged and interrogated their own kind of lens when it comes to the fact that the political economy that underpins the political debates we're having has fundamentally shifted since 2008. Uh, and it reminds me of uh, the, the American writer Matt Taibbi talks about uh, baseball journalism in the 1930s and 40s in the American South, uh, obviously in the era of Jim Crow, and talked about how you had a whole group of journalists who would go along to the games and they'd report on which players were doing well and which players weren't and the transfers between the different teams. Mm -hmm. And what was left unspoken the entire time was that it was, uh, you know, it was a system of effective racial segregation and uh, black leave, leagues were completely separate and the entire thing was underpinned by a system of exclusion and violence. And to not be too facetious with the analogy, it seems as if uh, that same problem of not interrogating the parameters of, of the thing that you're, you're reporting on and not recognising in the case of the financial crisis that really people's, the, the shift in people's material conditions has affected a, a, a transformation in their political imaginations. That, that, that's a real issue with, with, with lots of the pundits and lots of the uh, 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 commentators that, that, we, that we have now, and that most of the people we pay to kind of navigate that terrain for us are using outdated maps. Uh, so I just wondered if, not just you, Stephen, but anyone had any opinions on that, specifically the kind of financial crisis and the way that that shifted. Cheers. I just want to say, well, Rachel's just uh, pointed out that the uh, general population is uh, somewhere to the left of the centre, if, you know, if we can talk about it as left anyway. So does any of this matter? I mean, isn't it, maybe is it just masochism that uh, people on the left 
are uh, watching too much TV. <laughs> I mean, if anything, it, we can know anything tonight, it's that masochism is clearly something that's really popular with us all. Um. <laughs> We're back to that theme again, I see. <laughs> Um, in terms of do journalists have a grip on the paradigm shift that was 2008, the answer is clearly no. Like, our political classes haven't either. Neither have our, you know, people who are, you know, the 1% who are in charge of the majority of the world's wealth. We have not come to grips with the reality of climate change and how much of a disaster that is and will continue to be. Um, I think to, you know, blame it on, you know you screwed over freelance journalists for not being able to adequately grapple with this. It's like this is a crisis of global capital, not merely the, a crisis of perceiving global capital and its changes. It's interesting that you brought up uh, Jim Crow uh, segregation era because that's actually something that I wrote down when you were talking, Rachel, because you were talking about, well, you know, broadly there's public support for a well-funded NHS, broadly there is public support um, for a, you know, social safety net and thinking about the initial framing of your question about like well you know there's a debate to be had around spanking children oh wait no there's not well I think this points to something which is how do ideas become hegemonic right first mainstream and then hegemonic which you know th that was really pretentious like powerful and the fact is in 1963 the majority of white people in the South were not pro-civil rights. They thought that the activities of even um, the pacifist wings of the civil rights movement overall were bad for the project of dismantling, uh, of dismantling segregation. We now know that to be fraff. Again, if you go back 60 years, the majority of people would be like, what do you mean you don't hit your children? And so one of the things I would like all of us to interrogate, so that's very easy for us to sit back and say, well, yeah, our ideas are now mainstream, yeah, Right, well-funded welfare state, Poor, imagine if you didn't think that that was important. The fact is, is that those ideas have got a grip on people because one, it reflects their material circumstances and two, because we fought for it. And there are some unpopular ideas which I think need fighting for too. And they're the ones which we've largely shied away from. So the question of the violence of borders, for instance, or indeed what it means to have a less racist, less violent police force. Right? Even we on the left, because we've got a kind of you know, sniff of blood in the water when it comes to a crumbling Tory government, we're shying away from these things. So the idea isn't just how do we reflect a mainstream popular will, but also how do we change some of it for more just, more equitable outcomes? I think when, when things aren't going well for people, they tend to want to know why and they become more inquisitive about why their circumstances have changed, um, why the context has changed since 2008, you know, what's happened, um, become more engaged with politics more generally. Uh, I think that a platform like Labour's in the last election would only have been successful in the context where people can do their own research and read the manifesto and yes, the policies cut through, and yes, the broadcast strategy was brilliant, and yes, we had something to say every day, and the Tories didn't. But that's because we, cha we, we departed from the orthodoxy that said that you... you co effectively, what, what happens in elections is politicians, um, they make politician statements, which are things that people cannot possibly disagree with, like, I want everyone to fulfil their potential. No one's going to say, I don't want anyone to fulfil... You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Whereas what we said, and well, I say we, uh, what Jeremy Corbyn said in the, in the election was, we're going to tax these people more to pay for this thing. And what that does is it creates an antagonism. Because yes, you can say, we're not going to tax these people more because we don't want to pay for this thing. And when you do that, you set the terms of the debate. And that's what was really interesting. It wasn't just the fact that we had the means or the, the, the method in social media to carry the message but it was what the message was, and it was bold, and it wasn't like, all right, we're just gonna, you know, not, we won't rock the boat, we're gonna try and be what people would perceive as competent, and you know, the, we were like, no, actually, we're gonna tax the top 5%, and we're gonna pay for this stuff. And I think that, that when, yeah, as I say, when you do that, it does, it does set the frame of debate, and I don't think the left has done that. 
in a, a, a long time, actually, probably since Attlee. And, and interestingly, that it was the biggest swing to a political party in a general election since Attlee. So what does that tell you? <laughs> So in, in terms of the financial crisis and um, pundits reflecting on how that impacted on people, working in a newsroom, I definitely saw a generational divide about how people approach that. So a lot of the pundits who got it wrong were people who, by the time the financial crash happened, they had a house, they had a pension. Nothing, like there was, there was no negative impact for them. I mean, obviously they could see that it was all very terrible for people, but it didn't impact them. Um, rather the time that they, it did maybe impact them or they did see it firsthand was um, in the 70s um, when they saw that state-led economies didn't work and they led to blackouts and what have you. And um, so they, they, you know, their finance, their sort of um, political awakening about around the financial crisis was, was very different. What I did see though was young people in the newsroom, myself included, who were like, I don't have a house. I spend most of my income on my rent. I have no pension, like, I have no future, like, wages are stagnating, like, where am I left? Because the financial crisis hit me, you know, and it, it, it hit a lot of younger commentators, and I saw younger commentators getting it right and older ones getting it wrong, so I think there's definitely, like, a generational divide within that for me. I think uh, in terms of the kind of curiosity in the lobby about the impact of the financial crisis. I think the problem, partly because the hours are so long, is that what you end up recruiting for is uh, stamina and um, curiosity and also, crucially, low attention spans. So there were lots of people who basically thought and said in 2008, and you can see some of the people who got it wrong writing in 2008, look, this is going to have big political consequences. And then what happened is in 2010, an orthodox conservative was elected, and they basically went, oh, I got that wrong. And, what, and, it's, and weirdly, they over, they, they've now had to have these shocks to start correcting back to the original sort of like, oh, wait, actually, um, the, this, this is, this is going to have big consequences. But it's happening very slowly, and in some places, it's kind of this weird counter-revolution of, of, actually, I wasn't wrong. But overall, people are starting to notice, hmm, perhaps what's happened with wages is going to have political repercussions. Who knew? I think in terms of, of, of your point about, you know, given where, the, where people actually are, how used to... I mean, so terms like left and right, obviously most people think of themselves as centrists, right, regardless of, of where their views actually are on the political spectrum, right? You know, whether or not they you know, believe in a top, top tax rate of, of 90% or they believe in you know, detention centres for asylum seekers, right? People go, oh, I'm the middle ground, right? It's, which is why it is a bit of a weird pundit construct. But I think Ash is exactly right that... Um, it's very easy uh, after a very good result, you know, a massive advance, particularly when you consider how bad the 2015 result actually was for Labour, to neglect the fact that this was a, the, you know, it's not like Jeremy didn't triangulate on the police. He didn't triangulate on immigration and the right to move wherever the hell people wish. And actually, partly because the post uh, financial crisis centre ground or common ground or whatever you want to call it is. The economic model hasn't worked, but I actually don't like immigrants. And, and bluntly, the Labour Party did not challenge that centre ground mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the last election. So I, I think it's very important, yes, to be happy about what happened, but absolutely not to let go of, of the fact that there is a centre ground, which is where voters are, which is kind of fungible. But in terms of the absolute issues of left and right, which would emanate us, there were some things in which the 2017 election was a great advance for, and there were others in which it was absolutely a kind of continuing retreat, and one, the central one of which was, was borders, borders themselves as a concept. Yeah, I think that's a really important example of, um, of uh, why it's necessary to engage with, you know, the toxic and self self-loathing pursuit of watching TV um, because it because it does um, there's there's something because because the political spectrum has been so narrowly defined for so long um, and the para parameters have been so narrow for so long um, there's something about uh, even if those ideas and certainly those economic ideas are more popular than we might be led to believe there's still something about putting it out there so that people have a uh, a confidence, a political confidence, an intellectual confidence in those ideas and, and, and the perception that they're not niche, 
They're not fringe, they're not minority, they are mainstream views. And to follow on from that, that is exactly why it's really important for um, Labour to, to take on this um, debate around immigration, because that has been one area where it's been such a long, constant, all-pervading, drip, drip, anti-immigration sentiment that has permeated our political discourse from left to right. Um, and you can see on things like, you know, pe people, uh, the hostility that people have to um, uh, migrants in the UK is always high, apart from the ones that work in the NHS. And you can see that that's because <laughs> everybody always bashes migrants, apart from the ones that work in the NHS, right? Politicians broadly do kind of throw out these sentences that say migrants do a great job um, uh, in our NHS, we're lucky to have them here, it makes it run efficiently, we all love the NHS, right? So that's created this little bubble of sort of progressiveness around a largely anti-immigration um, uh, conversation, um, thereby kind of suggesting that if there was more of that kind of pro-immigration conversation in the national conversation in a way that there hasn't been, then that might actually uh, filter down and, uh, and a change public perception. Thank you. Um, so before we give a round of applause to our amazing panellists, it's been a really, really interesting debate. Um, there is a party afterwards, which you should all come to. Woo, woo, woo. Uh, it's at Synergy on Middle Street. No, West Street. West Street. Um, it's two pounds if you have a wristband, five pounds if you don't. There's tickets on the door. Uh, we'll be there. So yeah, do come. And yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.